Hello and welcome to our service of morning prayer. Uh, this is the first Sunday uh, of February, I think, and uh, we it is, and we have uh, the second Sunday before Lent. Would you believe Ash Wednesday is just uh, about ten days away? So uh, we'll be thinking about that a little bit later in our service. If you wish to follow the service in your prayer book. Uh, the page numbers of the Psalms and Canticles and Collects uh, and where we are in the book have already appeared on the screen. You can go back and have a look, check those out, mark your places or if you just want to follow what comes up on the screen uh, the text will appear uh, for you. Uh, so we try and make it as easy as possible uh, to access this worship if you're joining us from some other part of the world or some other denomination or no denomination of Christianity at all, you are most welcome. Uh, we are Church of Ireland. We are part of the Anglican Communion. Uh, we're at the low church end of that for those who are initiated into our uh, terminology. Uh, and the service this morning is uh, morning prayer two from the Church of Ireland prayer book. The Lord be with you. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure offering for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his Spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives the sins of all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. O oh, shout to the Lord and triumph all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his face with songs of joy. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his holy name. For the Lord is good. His loving mercy is forever his faithfulness throughout all generations. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 104. O Lord, how manyfold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea spread far and wide, and there move creatures beyond number, both small and great. There go the ships, and there that leviathan, which you have made to play in the deep. All of these look to you, to give them their food in due season. When you give it them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good. When you hide your face, they are troubled. When you take away their breath, they die and return again to the dust. 
When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will make music to my God while I have my being. So shall my song please him while I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed out of the earth and the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Alleluia. Glory to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. We have a reading from the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Colossian Church, chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, he writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We praise you, O God, we acclaim you as the Lord, all creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, the cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world the Holy Church acclaims you, Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son, worthy of all praise, the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. Our Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to St John, chapter 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. The life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him, but to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. The Lord has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through the holy prophets God promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hand of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous before him all the days of our life. 
And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have had uh, lots of scripture, as we always do in our liturgy, uh, and uh, my parishioners will be familiar with me banging on about this and saying, uh, it's one of our great strengths of liturgy, and we cast it aside uh, to our great cost. We read scripture for the first 10 or 15 minutes of our service. We read scripture together. How we approach that scripture is much more nuanced than uh, we might be led to believe, particularly by the fundamentalist school of thought. Uh, people who say things like, well, I simply uh, say what the Bible says. Well, there is a complexity of things that the Bible says. The Bible was not read, sorry, was not written by one person. It is the product of two millennia of uh, prayer, meditation, reworking, editing and thought. It is, of course, guided and touched by God the Holy Spirit. In whatever way we understand that, I have no uh, problem with that. But the Bible is uh, complex. Jesus himself uh, declares that he has not come to overthrow the law. And let's for shorthand say that's just the first five books of the Bible. But he says he has come to fulfill the law. And certainly Christianity takes on board the law, but on our own terms. And we've been thinking about that within our Bible studies on the Acts of the Apostles. We adapt how we uh, take the law to ourselves. And therefore, uh, uh, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi might say, this is what the Bible says. And we would say, yes, that's what the Bible says. But because of what Jesus says, and because of what St. Paul says, we understand it in this way or that way. The Bible interprets itself. It is the Spirit of God who gives us the wisdom and insight to understand the written word. And there are those parts of the Bible that are problematic to us, largely problematic because whatever culture we come from and whatever age we live in, our education, our background, the prevalent and predominant philosophies and uh, beliefs of that age will influence how we read the Bible. I am a great believer in rational uh, thought. People probably who know me think, Alan, you're the least rational person I know. Uh, and in that, I'm a contradiction. Aren't you a contradiction? We are all contradictions in many ways. We hold many different ideas at the same time. I had a conversation with a man about three years ago, two or three years ago, uh, who was having watched uh, documentaries on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, and so on. Uh, many of these calling into question the veracity of the, the Scripture, cast doubt on the Scripture, and then came out with the most bonkers idea, uh, quoting uh, the story in Genesis of Cain and Abel, uh, to justify a racist view of the world. Completely bonkers idea, but taking it literally. Dispensing it on the one hand and taking it literally on the other. And we're all full of these ideas. And yet, we live in a world where rational thought and science has produced for us so much good, as well as a lot of things that are dubious. And we say, oh, science and scientists, I wouldn't be able to point this wee yoke, as we would call it, at that bare camera to make it come on and go off. I would not be able to be presenting to you any ministry of the word and sacrament, any reflection on uh, the year's cycle of prayer, the year's cycle of readings uh, and devotion uh, without the science of 
the camcorder in front of me, the remote control, the lamp in the corner, uh, and the internet. And yet, uh, I could happily live without all of those things. Probably because I'm old enough to have lived without them before they came along. I could cope uh, if they disappeared. Science has presented to us resolutions to the world pandemic. And uh, while uh, if you get a job, it's not a free ticket to go running up the street and hugging everybody you meet or immediately to dive back into society, uh, we will, much sooner than we might have expected in previous times, uh, have resolutions. And yet there's an irrationality in society that's calling this good science into question. And I would plead to you to accept this good science and the gift that it is to society. For the people who are going to refuse, there will be people who can't have the, uh, the injection, maybe due to pre-existing conditions, but people who refuse the vaccine ultimately are putting their own health, well-being and life at risk. But they might also be putting uh, others' lives at risk as well. That's a good thing. And yet our scientific worldview and our modern worldview, and by that I mean the, the, the way we understand the world that has evolved over the last 500 years, since the Renaissance, since the Enlightenment and, Re and Reformation, and the growth of scientific practice across the world and all the things that that has given to us, in a world that believes in bricks and mortar, uh, we come to these extraordinary texts of Old and New Testament that are given by God, absolutely, but we come to them with a very literalistic view already imprinted upon us. And you even hear that in a discussion with an unbelieving person who says, I don't believe in God, and then blames God for what God has done. And don't believe in God, and then use God-based arguments to disbelieve in God. We are contradictions in ourselves, and we need to acknowledge that. And we bring a template of how we look at the world to how we interpret scripture. And we've been brought up since we were little small children. And I don't call into doubt that one and one equals two. This isn't uh, George Orwell's world just yet. Uh, though in a world that says there are different facts, uh, we need to resolutely stand for the rational understanding of fact. One and one makes two. Two. One and one makes two. Okay? Uh, and all of the that, that we extrapolate out from that worldview is that we understand the world in terms of equation. That there's cause and there's effect. That everything is based on a model uh, like physics where you drop a stone into a pond and you watch ripples and that's molecules bumping into each other. That everything can be defined and refined and everything can be analysed and understood. And certainly we can apply our analytical uh, and forensic tricks of the early 21st century to how we approach uh, the text. It can be very, very useful. It's one thing to do that with the text. But how do we understand the mysteries of the faith, the theologies, philosophies, the doctrines, the insights? How do we understand all these things? And we bring this Rather legalistic, literalistic, scientistic view of the world. And we plant it on top of uh, an ancient culture, ancient teachings that are still beautiful and relevant to us today. That radiate the good news of God's kingdom. That tell us of who Jesus is and the love that he brings. That tells us of a messiah. That opens out God's grace to humanity. And we want it to proceed in our world view. This is one reason why people come from the Western world. Which has purged itself of mystical reflective thought. And we look round for the mystical and the spiritual. And we reach into other uh, cultures, religions and philosophies. And we cherry pick 
bits out of it. Pilates. I'm not going to have a dig at yoga. You know, we'll talk about that some other time. One to one. I'm not going to have a dig at yoga and Pilates, okay? But it emanates out of India and Hinduism. That's, that's the background of yoga, Pilates and those things. It comes from the Hindu traditions of India. People on TV come on and say, oh, I've just done the Pilates and now I feel all Zen. Which comes out of Japan. Another world of hundreds of millions of people and a world of a billion plus people and all these things. And we just cherry pick. And we go along and you know we find out that the Murrays did this and we take that bit of their faith. And you see it all the time on daytime television. Oh, daytime television. I'm seeing too much of it. And I try to do other things. And the sun's starting to peep out. And there are jobs to be done in the garden. And I'm looking forward to getting out of hibernation mode. And into doing mode more and more outside. I have stuff to do today. And I'm looking forward to getting the hands on. The hands dirty. Uh, and working at stuff. And you know. You watch some of it and uh, people are channeling what unicorns are saying to us uh, via a, a statue of a Buddha and a cross or what mermaids might be telling us and all that type of thing. Because we've lost it in our own society. We have used the scientific, literalistic, legalistic equation based interpretation of the word to purge our word of mysticism so we have to go looking for it elsewhere now we can look for it within Christianity largely the Christian traditions of Eastern Europe and, and the Mediterranean and we need to find them again uh, because they're there and they're very beautiful hard to understand but the idea of mysticism is that you don't ultimately understand you accept and uh, grow and enjoy through it. And so we, we bring this formulaic uh, approach to the, the scriptures, to the word of God. And we need definitions. We have the three creeds. We need to be able to jump into John chapter 1 verses 1 to 14 and work through it and discern what we may from it. And the same with the, the passage from Col uh, Colossians which talks in great detail about who Jesus is, that he is uh, God incarnate, just as the, the John chapter 1 uh, tells us. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And, and that is a, a statement of our faith. And we have to be able to approach it with a certain amount of scientific and forensic and legal ease to, to, to work our way through it. But we quite easily kill the plant that we're trying to grow. We quite easily damage the beauty that we wish to experience. We quite easily crush the little bird that's landed in our hand. The thing of beauty that God has given to us, the message of, of the incarnation, brings God's love and grace and goodness to us. So we have to have the definitions. They give us our perception of orthodoxy. They keep us uh, right in many respects. But we also have to have the ability to not allow that to press down and press down. I have a friend who has rediscovered his love for painting. He's really, really good. And one of the things he confesses to me, I can barely draw a straight line with a pencil. Uh, and one of the things that, that I have learned from him is, he, is learning when to stop is the hardest thing for him to know what to do. Learning when to stop adding to it. That's probably the same in music. It's the same in preaching. Learning when to stop. <laughs> you can press your button. You know, Learning when to stop. Have you egged the pudding uh, overly? Uh, because there's a danger that there's a thing of beauty before us. There's the thing of beauty like the Holy Communion, the Eucharist. A thing of great spiritual beauty and wonder. And we have it defined and defined and defined and defined. 
and we know our orthodoxy and we know our position on it and we know what we know it is or we think we know what we know it is and we know exactly what we think and we know it's not and yet the person who kneels beside you and we will be back to that when the person who kneels beside you, you don't know that their definition is their definition more orthodox than, than, than yours is my definition less orthodox than the people who live, kneel before me Ultimately, we have to let go of the definition and say, there's a thing of great wonder here. There's a thing of great beauty here. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And we will say the creed in a minute, and we bring definition to that. But let's not crush the beauty of it and lose the wonder and the glory of it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things were created through him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Thanks be to God for the wonder of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the queen and grant her government wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless those whom you have chosen. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and let your glory be over all the earth. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and renew us by your Holy Spirit. The Collect for the Second Sunday Before Lent Almighty God, you have created the heavens and the earth and made us in your own image. Teach us to discern your hand in all your works and your likeness in all your children through Jesus Christ our Lord who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns supreme over all things now and forever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and in all things guide us to know and do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We give thanks to you, O Lord our Father, for the great glory and wonder and beauty of your Son, Jesus Christ. We bow before you now, Father, 
and bless your holy name. We glorify you and worship you this day. We present before you our prayers and petitions, praying for the church and all the world, and for John, our bishop, Archbishop of Armagh and primate of all Ireland. Bless your servant John and all who minister in this diocese. Be with all the rectors, lay readers, parish readers, church wardens, honorary treasurers, honorary secretaries of parishes, select vestry members, and all the people who do the different tasks around our churches and parishes. Be with each one who comes under our care and with all the people of this land and indeed all the people of the world we pray O Lord that the truth of your love your light and your mercy your goodness and your grace might shine forth even in the darkness of these days we pray for those who care for the sick especially for those who work in the intensive care units and the doctors and nurses and other staff who are deployed in those most difficult of circumstances. For now, having worked for almost a year under intense pressure, and we pray for them, for their physical and mental health, for their overall well-being. We pray, O oh Lord, for your strength to sustain them. And we give thanks for the science that has brought us so many of these different vaccines that can be deployed and we pray that as the vaccine rolls out that the impact of the virus would be rolled back that lives would be saved that people who become ill would become less ill and that most people would be protected we give you thanks O lord for those great minds that you have given to our brothers and sisters who have brought us this breakthrough we pray that in the advance of the virus and the rule of the vaccine and the rolling back of the virus, those doctors and nurses would soon be relieved from this unbearable pressure. Drive from us all falsehood. Drive from us all wrong thinking on these matters and on every matter. And help us to submit ourselves to truth from whichever quarter it comes. For you are the way and the truth and the life. For as all healing emanates from you, so all truth comes from the throne of our Heavenly Father. So we commit and commend ourselves and our loved ones into your care and keeping, O Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.